Hey everybody, uh, my name is James Medeiros. I'm your room monitor, username DJ M E D E I R in IRC. Welcome. I'm so excited today uh, to introduce this talk, Empowering Users by Asking Them for Money with Martin Owens. Um, before I read his bio, <laughs> hey, uh, I have to say we've just been spending probably the last half hour, half, I think a whole hour even chatting. He's a really cool guy. Um, He'll be presenting uh, a topic, as I said, called empowering users by asking them money for money, which I think is great. Uh, he's a software programmer currently focused on the Inkscape graphic program, which I'm sure you've all heard about, and on economics in the free software ecosystem. Martin and other Inkscape developers have been using personal funding platforms to raise the money to make their work more stable and user focused. And in this talk, he'll tell you about his experiences and his ideas on how to change free software economics from the current business model on business versus volunteers to a more equitable arrangement for both users and developers. Before I turn it over to him, um, just a reminder, I know you've been here for a while, uh, please do submit your questions in the IRC throughout the chat because we're gonna have a nice dedicated chunk of, of Q&A time uh, at the very end. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Martin. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you, James. Uh, thank you, everybody, for um, joining my talk here at Libre Planet. A big th thank you to the organizers for selecting this talk. I'm pretty excited to talk about this topic with a wider audience. Now, everything here is based on my experiences and thoughts, and I am interested in the, the questions and con conversations at the end, because this is a contentious topic sometimes. Um, let's see. So the first thing is, Every time I talk about programmers, uh, what I really mean is like any skilled creator. So whether it's an artist or a video maker or anyone, but I'm here really to talk to programmers specifically about uh, their work. Uh, but this talk is about users. It's not about developers. Uh, as a community, we've talked a lot about pro programmers needing to be paid for, for their work. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be fo focusing instead on, on users themselves. This doesn't mean that I've forgotten pro programmers, but uh, I wanted to, you know, f focus things on users themselves and what this means for them. Um, programmers are powerful. Uh, in the free software world, they're free to exercise the full range of free freedoms through their exclusive knowledge and con confidence in the art of programming. Uh, Non-programmers, on, on the other hand, don't have the skills and are excluded from exercising one of the most powerful free freedoms that we have in the free software universe, which is the freedom to change the software to make it do what you want it to do. Um, freedom for me is skills plus the will uh, to, to make change. And a free software pro programmer has both the freedom, uh, you know, to, to do these things and to, and to know how to do it. Um, where a user might have the need to make cha changes, but uh, they don't often have the skills necessary. And sometimes maybe they have the skills, but they don't have the time necessary. As a community, how do we currently serve users so that they, that, you know, with the kinds of cha changes that they, they might need to the, the free software that they use in their everyday life? First is we often ignore users completely. Um, this is a predominant view of especially smaller projects, and it's a natural outcome of the kind of participatory communities where programming literacy is the entry price. Um, and if you can't pro program, um, you're not really free in these com communities to the same extent. The next type of way in which we serve users is uh, what, I'm, what I term uh, charitable paternalism. Larger pro projects have developed a more sophisticated way of serving non-programmers. Um, this is the notion of charitable paternalism, and there's a lot of good work that happens in the name of charity in the free software world. Um, and it's a very important part of who, who we are as a community, that our kindness and compassion for others allows us to help uh, users uh, with their pro programming needs. Um, but imagine you have a large, well-regarded pro pro project, a project that is deeply gen generous, and yet it still doesn't listen to its users very much. Um, maybe because it doesn't really have a need to. Uh, the project will have well-meaning paternalism, a sense that the pro project knows what's best for users and the people that work in the pro project are best placed to make the decisions about what should be developed and what shouldn't. Um, this can create great so software, and we have many great exam examples of this model, 
but it's not freedom for users. Um, the next way in which we can in interact with users is basically indenture responsibility. Um, this is where projects that and programmers that want to listen to users, they spend time finding out what users want and they help them and program for their for their needs, even if they don't necessarily agree with the ch changes that the user needs. But they do the work because they're responsible and they're generous. But this creates a labor rights issue, right? Um, the bigger the user that's making requests for change changes, the more problematic this kind of relationship gets. Um, but it's problematic all, all, all the way down, right? We're working for free on other people's needs is not always a good idea. It's often not stable. Um, you know, programmers who serve the users' in, in interest while not making a living, they're servants to the public interest. Um, many programmers also shy away from being as generous as they could otherwise be to user needs simply because of a sense of responsibility that will inevitably lock them into continuing to work for, for free. So what do we do? Introducing money. So this talk is hard for me. Uh, politically, I'm a socialist, right? Public ownership is in my core. I don't want money to be a solution, uh, but in the world that we have, the mechanisms that we have, markets and money are a serious tool we can choose to use while understanding that there are risks and there are downsides as well, which I'm going, which I'm going to cover. Purpose of money in the free software project is to enable pro programmers to carry out the will of the user. It's not supposed to be a reward for past deeds, uh, but a payment for the service of pro programming on the behalf of somebody else. The programmer becomes the conduit through which the user's freedom to change the software is carried out. But users' ideas can be terrible, right? A programmer can act as a guide uh, and, and a worker and advise users about the best kinds of changes which are most likely to be merged into a project. Um, it's good for the user, merge cha changes are more state stable and val valuable. But if a user asks the pro programmer to fit wheels to a tomato, she accepts the job. Personal fox, is completely valid, right? Serving your user's needs, and that's kind of the point of free freedom, right? It's not about what the project wants or the programmer wants, it's about what the user wants, right? The project's free freedom is only in deciding whether the work should be merged or not, right? Not whether the, whether the work should be ever done at all. So is this just a support search and service? So the way I think, I, I think of it, support is when you go into some, somebody else's home, and you fix their computer. Programming for somebody is when they come to your office, tell you what to pro program, right? There's a fundamental di difference between fixing an in individual issue in, in a deployment and acting as an agent for a user's free freedom. Um, companies like Red Hat and Canonical and others, um, they serve regular users through support contracts, allowing them to invest the money that they get for, for those services into you know free desktop ecosystems for example it's true that they do a lot of good work the vast majority of it is really good but now we're back to paternalism except this one isn't charitable right there's always going to be um, half an eye that corporations will be putting towards the people who are actually paying them for work right and users that are not involved in that ecosystem they won't have a voice in what gets to developed So we in the free software universe have spent a long time and effort creating infrastructure for programmers, uh, legal infrastructure, technical infrastructure, charitable infrastructure, and more. But the weak arm has always been our economic infrastructure, mostly because as a community, we're not yet convinced that there's a need to have any. Um, and I'm gonna discuss three uh, methods that I currently use to uh, engage in some economic activity. First is bartering. Now, I know this might sound like a cheat, but it's worth men mentioning that paying doesn't have to involve money currency. Um, I've taken jobs where the pay payment was work that I needed some, some, somebody else to do. Informal bar bartering within a project can be a great social lubricant, um, but it could, it could and should also be offered to people outside of the project, right? I've done several bar barters for Inkscape fi fixes. 
And in fact, the graphics for this slide uh, were bartered with some Inkscape designers um, and artists so that they could help me make these slides. And, and in exchange, I fixed some specific issues um, with Inkscape that they needed, right? I paid attention to their needs uh, in, in this exchange. Um, as a community, we could be more open to finding situations where we could barter our skills, right? We don't have to have a formal system for, for it, but we should always be think, thinking, you know, is there a way of helping this per person that I have, uh, paying attention to their needs in some non-monetary way? Maybe there is. Second is contracting. Now, I'm an independent contractor. That's pr primarily what I've been doing for the, for the last few, few years. Um, most people, Paid free socks and software is done like this through contracting. Uh, it's a process whereby a business will come to a programmer, set out a programming job that they want, and the programmer delivers it, hopefully within the free software pro project itself. But it's hard to find good, trustworthy contractors that have been vetted. There's no standard web website that you can go to to fi find out, uh, to find a good whether a pro programmer is good or not, whether they've been involved in the pro project or not. And likewise, it's very hard for pro programmers to find good biz businesses that understand what investing in free, free software means uh, without, without the, that business expe expecting exclusivity to the, to, to the code, right? It's got to be published. Um, so in this essence, what we could do, more contractor infrastructure would really help in the free software world. And when I say infrastructure, I don't mean does a website somewhere on the, the internet technically exist for, for doing this. I mean... Uh, there is a blessed singular place where the community can go and like if, if somebody if a business came, came to you and asked you oh i'm looking for a contractor to do some free software work you can point them to this one place and go yeah go over there and they'll they'll find a person for for you right that would be a really good way of improving the the way in which uh, we can interact with especially small business businesses that might need more more hand holding the third and the most interesting for me as an independent uh, uh, contractor who works on Inkscape is uh, micro subscriptions. Now, I'm currently on Patreon. It's a proprietary ser 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 service. And before I joined, I weighed up the, the ethics of using it and the implications as a system, uh, you know, whether the reputation of the company uh, was good before, before I decided to use it. Um, but the mechanics are simple enough. Uh, users who cannot afford to give a programmer a large sum of money and instead uh, give a monthly subscription um, and the small amounts taken together can provide a meaningful in income to, to the developer. And in exchange, the programmer will be expected to pay attention to what the users need. Um, even in this, which would be a diluted sense, right? Users would have to be, to form a consensus perhaps, maybe there would be voting, maybe there would be prioritization, uh, but they would have a say, they'd be involved in a community, they'd be contributing. So users are, in, in the system, the way I do, do it is users are kept up to date with what, what the program is doing, what I'm doing in a blog. I provide a video blog every week. Uh, it's on YouTube, but it's also on my Patreon. It's also mirrored elsewhere. Uh, and also other pat patrons, but not me, uh, can provide things like stickers and t-shirts and um, uh, access to things before everybody else. Although, you know, within re reason, while Patreon has been designed with video cre creators in mind, it does work relatively well for programmers as well. We could do this in the free software world. A micro subscription infrastructure, uh, like the contracting infrastructure above, which was blessed, well known, importantly singular, would be a great help. Uh, you know, digging into the kinds of work that paid patron does for its users, it's a hard problem, right? It would need dedicated, tireless work to figure out all of the international laws, sales and income tax and taxes and all of the other stuff beside. But if it's something that we think is important, we should definitely consider having a free software equivalent, which was uh, well known and everybody used, right? So having talked about money and the ways in which uh, economics can be introduced, now I'm going to talk about the problems, right? So you've got some money into your project. What are the pro problems within in introducing paid development certs and services, right? So I want to tell you about both sides. Uh, the first issue that I've that I've seen is transactional. Uh, ooh, sorry, I misslided that. Um, 
The first issue is what's known as transactional behavior. Programmers can become less generous and um, more likely to consider changes uh, transactional, right? They might sit on improvements rather than um, until they get significantly uh, recompensed for their time. This is primarily a cultural issue. Um, you know, having a culture of generosity, understanding what it means to do work in the public interest as well as in the private interest can help. You know, projects with good codes of conduct can, can express what it means to do a private and public interest work. Um, another problem is uh, socioeconomic discrimination, right? This is a serious problem. The nature of money means that, you know, a significant proportion of people don't have any money, right? Even with micro pay, pay, pay payments, you have to consi con consider continuing to help people who don't have any money through things like the charity methods. But also I think through education, right? We should as projects be offering skills and things so that these users have are empowered through their education to be able to contribute to projects. Um, I think if all projects had uh, education as one of the things that they did, uh, we would be able to um, encourage uh, individuals to be involved if they could, um, whether it's bartering or, or programming directly. Uh, the second is internal competition or pro programmers competing against each other. Um, you know, programmers have a deep fear, like all hu human beings, of missing out on re rewards uh, when others are being paid for, for their work can create a negativity between people who would otherwise be collaborating. Having a good understanding of where the lines are drawn between, you know, the private enterprise work and the public participation, I think is, is critical for avoiding any kind of infighting uh, over what may be seen as a as a um, lose-lose or, you know, uh, sing, single pie, uh, ungrowable pie. But uh, again, this is a project culture thing you can uh, engage in your codes of conduct and have a straight documented way in which you approach uh, competition for what could be you know a single contract um, next is project corruption so projects where paid pro programmers it both administer the project uh, and also work on it um, may bend the pro project towards their own economic interests this is why uh, public interest is still a very good thing that we should do and we should have uh, in, in free software projects. Keeping the paid parts of the pro project outside of administration decisions is a good idea. To avoid a very human temptation, right, that can happen to any programmer um, that has a need to grow their subscriptions or contracts and, uh, you know, the pa and, and power over a project's infrastructure. Um, making sure that the project has a public interest policy may, or, or a charitable stru structure that can organize and keep everybody honest, uh, maybe what a lot of pro projects need. Um, now having talked about the problems, let's talk about the conclusions. So these are the pro pro problems that I'm on guard for, uh, but there could be others. Um, as I continue my mission to invite users to contribute to the Inkscape pro project through me, uh, contracting, Patreon, bartering were possible. Um, I'm trying lots of different, different things to figure out how we can serve uh, both the public at large and also users as, as individuals. Uh, I think that free starts and software would be stronger with more free freedom, and that means involving involvement from more people with different resources not sources other than pro, pro programming skills. Empowering users means finding ways of converting their resources into their needs. And if what they have is money and what they need is software programming change changes to your free software pro project, then we as pro programmers could make sh should make sure that it's easier to contribute, right? By asking them for money and in so do doing, empowering them to have all of the free freedoms they ought to have. Um, and that is my talk. Thank you very much for listening. I realized that this was actually pretty short, 20, 20 minutes. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, I, I, really may have, I may have rushed this so so badly, so I apologize if I <laughs> talk too fast. No, don't apologize at all. And um, I may just have actually accidentally closed my hex chat, so that's not great. <laughs> oh no! Um, I know it's like the perfect comedy of. Uh... So I, I should tell everybody. I actually I actually practiced this talk, and it took the thirty five minutes last time. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did all the right things. Oh, well. so. Um, the, I do remember that while I opened my hex chat, there, there, uh, there was a, there was some comments. People uh, loved um, 
you know, the introducing money slide and, and the kind of, uh, you know, the idea of the right way and the wrong way to use money. And uh, again, while I pull up my hex chat, there is another, um, there's another question. Oh, yes, and, and you, you touched on it, but I wonder if you can expand on it. And it was, uh, I can't remember how you termed it, but it was about how the, uh, um, sorry, I just had it. <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, you know, in, inherently by, uh, you know, money is power and, uh, you know, um, and, and obviously uh, people with more money have more power. So how do you kind of balance that, I guess, is a good question to start with. So it's absolutely true that, uh, you know, the, the reason why you, you may not want money to uh, be involved is simply egalitarian, right? You want to be able to make decisions from the project's best interests. Um, but having said that, um, a rich man's freedom is fr still free freedom, right? And you know, being paid by a business um, to to make changes to your project or even a fork for them. As a programmer, you can make decisions about what work you want to take, right? Whether you think that the work is is too large, whether it's too manipulative. Uh, I feel like being an independent project, uh, independent contractor allows me a lot of latitude in deciding what work I want to take. I think if um, Microsoft came to me and said, here's a million dollars to like make Inkscape a really horrible tool to use, um, I probably wouldn't take the work. Um, that would be denying Microsoft their free freedom to make ch changes, but then again, they're big enough and ugly enough to buy enough programmers to do whatever they want, right? Big and uglier. Some interesting <laughs> adjectives there. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's, that's just a colloquial saying. I, I don't mean to impugn anybody. No, I wasn't disagreeing with you either. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another comment. Uh, having the international contracting infrastructure ties in nicely to the keynote yesterday. I'm not sure if you saw it, but uh, this person says there was a, the, the key, specifically the keynote on acclimatizing the German government to fund uh, international developers to develop. I, I did software. see that, yes. Yeah, I did see that. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it is interesting, actually, how uh, governments in some ways are, are, are more attuned to being able to contract uh, universities as well. I, uh, several of the contracts that I've managed to secure have been with universities because culturally they're more capable of understanding, oh, we're, we're hiring somebody to do work on this. Oh, and it gets published in the public, right? Um, Smaller businesses, independents, people like even larger businesses, to be honest, they're not culturally kitted out yet. And so having some good education uh, for all different types of uh, organizations that might interact with us as developers would be good, right? We want to be able to serve their needs, whether they're an individual Inkscape user who's an artist who's doing it uh, as a small individual, like as a business, as a designer, or if they're a big designer house or a CNC work workshop, et cetera, from my, my perspective. Right. Um, on micro subscriptions, and uh, I know you mentioned you use the, the Patreon platform, mm -hmm. um, just to call out, people have been kind of starting their own list here. So I don't know if you have anything to supplement that, or um, but just to share others that people called out as Open Collective, Open Snow Collective. Drift. It's no um, someone said uh, Libra Pay, and another person chimed in, Libra Celery, but I haven't heard of that one, and somebody asked if it's, yeah. they're not sure if it's operational yet. Yeah, so I mean, one of the great things about a lot of these infrastructure uh, websites and things are they are at attempting to attack this problem, which is a great sign because it means that we as a community are starting to get our heads around what may be necessary. The reason why I was explicit in saying that we need something that is blessed is that we need the leaders in our community to make a call about what kind of infrastructure we should have as a as a community right and say no libre pay is the way to do it right and for us to focus on making sure that's easy for users to use i can't stress this enough the reason why i'm on patreon is because it's where inkscape users can get to where i'd be confident pointing an inkscape user to who isn't a programmer isn't involved in the free software world and it's a place where i can communicate with with them um, you know, it, it, it doesn't help us if the tools are technically functional, but not designed well, um, which is why, like, there's an awful lot of effort that needs to be put in, both leadership-wise, design-wise, and, like, making sure we have all of our ducks in a, in, a, in a row about what it is we want, the interaction between a free software pro project and individual users or small businesses to be. 
right? No, that makes sense. The leadership piece. Um, just to to tie into that, somebody agreed. You're absolutely right about the economic infrastructure is less mature than the legal and the technical. Um, I've got a few more questions lining up here um, that I'll jump to, but I did wonder from my myself personally. You know, I um, I think I mentioned I to you in our green room chat. I, I'm a project manager, but in the healthcare space in Ontario, and uh, and I think you were talking about potential, you know, from a contracting standpoint under standpoint under that theme and a list of programmers that people could reach out to. So are, were you saying that that's something that doesn't exist or the term that comes to mind and it's the wrong word, but in terms of um, public procurement in my sector, like the term vendor of record or something, is there is there any yeah. kind of vetted list out there? there are, again, very much like LibrePay and other stuff though, I, I've heard of a number of different uh, people who are attempting to attack this problem. Um, it's the kind of infrastructure that takes a lot of uh, effort. Like maybe we need a, a network of trust. Maybe we need, uh, you know, better trust models inside of our pro project so we can say for definite, you know, this person that worked with me on this free software pro project, you know, it's, it's important for me to give the thumbs up so that they can then get work uh, as a contractor. Um, you know, right now, if I work with somebody in, let's say I work with somebody on Inkscape, uh, very unlikely that the people who will contract me will ever see the reputation that I built uh, inside the community. Yeah. Um, and, it's, and that's a shame. And it's also true that like the contracts that I have may not ever be visible to people. Um, so that that reputation as well of me being a good work worker, good to hire, et cetera, is not also not visible with inside the project. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these, communications and trusts and, and and you know we need to be paying attention to how um we can make sure that uh business the freedom to, to make changes inside of our code is also something that we express in terms of uh, how trustworthy some, somebody is to make those cha changes on, on our behalf because it's going to be a critical part of, of like building a reputation yeah super important themes um this next one, I'll, I'll put to you your prerogative if you think it's slightly out of scope for this talk, but I, I think it might be interesting. And it's what was your process of evaluating the ethics of Patreon specifically? And I know you mentioned um, a lot of your users are already there, but were there other pieces to that? Uh, so I used to actually be subscribed to a bunch of YouTubers on a platform called Subbable, which was a Patreon like search and service that was then sold to Patreon. And, uh, you know, when that happened, I had to make a decision about like, do, do I think that Patreon is a monopoly? Do I think that they are, you know, abuse, abusive? Um, I'm consciously aware of the fact that like, it, it, as any web service turns into a monopoly, especially one that's proprietary, they're going to tend to what, they're gonna have temptation, right? To, to do things which are against the user's best interests. Um, it's good if, if if we must have proprietary services in this area, then having multiples of them would be a good, just in case, right, we have to move. The fact that we don't have a trust trusted charity, um, you know, to call out names like the SFC or the EFF or the FSF who can host this kind of economic activity on our behalf so to, yeah. to make sure that they're running the services in, in the most efficient and effective and non-profiteering way. But I, I uh, to get to the actual question, which is, uh, how did I make that assessment? Um, I basically looked at their blogs. I looked at like how they talked about their users. I looked at what uh, users were saying about them, um, about what users were saying about like the the, the fees that were charged and, and, the, and the percentages and so so forth. And I compared them to a bunch of other sites, uh, whether they seemed like a lot for for the kinds of work that they were doing. But considering the like the effort that it seems to be involved in in making sure that you have this like international search service that pe people from like Japan could sign up to and and pay me as a pay not donate pay me as a programmer in in America right that's madness that's something that actually is is quite a, a revolution in terms of you know the micro payments around the world I think this this next one I'm not sure if I understand the context fully so I'll I'll say it verbatim um but, but it is related to um, kind of investing in organizations being in different geographic locations. Um, it says, uh, we have charities and foundations to allow people to invest money, but in my opinion, they're hindered by the fact that they're often located in countries, which makes it difficult results. So they're saying, for example, um, 
uh, European wants to give money to a US based foundation or the reverse? Yeah, in fact, um, this, uh, so Inkscape is a is a, a software freedom conservancy project, and we are constantly getting messages from people in Japan and India and China yeah. saying that they cannot donate through PayPal to the to the SFC uh, to to Inkscape, which is a problem. It needs to be fixed. Uh, we don't know whether this is a configuration in pay, PayPal or something that you know organizationally has to be done, or whether it's just not possible, right? Whether the, a charity in the US just cannot accept donations from outside. Um, but it, it's, sorry, I've lost the train of thought of what I was doing there. Um, yeah, well, so, so we know it's a problem. Ahead, sorry, sorry we, we know it's a problem, like in international, um, international trade, right? There are, there, are, there are legal barriers put in place in order to stop fraud and stop issues between countries. Um, you know, money laundering is, is an excellent example. We never want a free software pro project to be in, involved in some, you know, international money laundering scheme. That's bad for the free software brand, let's say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, a, but it's a, you know, it's important for us to enable free software. Now, I'll be honest, if I could collectively scour every single person here in Boston uh, for their use of Inkscape and then convince them to donate money to me, sorry, pay me money, <laughs> you see, yeah. it's see how easy it is no, uh, totally. to pay me work on Inkscape on their behalf, right? They needed the software to change, to get better, to be improved. I would do that simply because it's local. And I believe like local economics is something we should strive for, right? And if there are corporations out there, uh, say for instance, if there's a small business in France who wants me to do a piece of work, and I know that like me or Mark or Tav or several other Inkscape developers could theoretically do this work. I might actually send them on and say, "Look, talk to this other contractor who I know who's in France, who could, you know, who might be able to to uh, do the work locally, right?" Simply because I think there are, there is less complications, uh, especially for contract work where there's there's uh, payments and actual signing of the documents and things. Um, and so, like having a good network of individuals in different countries. Um, Say for instance, if I had, if I knew a programmer in in India right, who could do the work, and an Indian company came to me and said we'd like to work in Inkscape, I'd love to be able to point them at that programmer and say, no, this 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 dude, like he doesn't work in Inkscape every day, but like he can do the work, and you know, I'd love to be able to introduce you to him. Oh, that's great. Um, somebody else asks uh, if you've read a book by Amanda Palmer called The Art of Asking. And they say in the book, she elaborates that asking for financial support is also a way to recognize and build a relationship. And it is. public users sometimes really want to be thankful. So I, I, th I found this really funny because I uh, talked with Amanda Palmer many years ago about this exact problem before the book came out. And it's like, how do you get uh, creatives, people who are doing work in the community and stuff, um, so it, it's it, it's really funny, especially when she was involved in that like, um, should we say, problem where she'd raised a bunch of money and then was not paying the artists that she was uh, being on stage with because it because for her, but uh, being on stage was was reward enough. Mm. Um, <laughs> there's definitely uh, a sense that you know you 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 should want to have a relationship with with users. And that takes time and it takes effort. Uh, you know, my Patreon is not free for me for for, 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 for time investment. I'm, I'm committed to making that relationship, but it does provide me with a with a way of talking to users of getting their input into into the things that are important to them, in a way that I don't think would necessarily have been available to to me if I wasn't uh, engaging with them on an economic level. level. Well, thanks for that. Um, just a comment here. I see the goal how to build and use infrastructure to create alternatives uh, to corporate capitalism. Somebody asks, uh, unless you wanted to comment on that, somebody asks, uh, how about an indirect barter? A gives to B and B gives to C and C gives to A. It's a bit of a... So, so this actually happens where, where, where you have what would be phrased as social capital, right? So uh, say you're in, invested in a project, uh, you would hope that you are building a reputation and you are um, being generous with your time and that in some way, this generosity would at some point in the future be fo refocused back on you as, as a um, uh, somebody else's generosity upon you, right? This is a good way of developing a community internally that's, that's kind and, and, and available to each other, right? And, and responsive to each other's needs. Um, 
if you have a person from outside, however, like it gets harder because you've got, you, you have trust issues and tracking and things like that. Um, even between projects, right? So if I, I've had the most devil of a time uh, reporting issues and, and, and talking with people in the non project. I don't know why, but every single time I engage, it falls to pieces. And part of it seems like the reputation that I have in the England Skipper project doesn't follow me right. <laughs> so on project. So they're like, oh, look, there's just this dude who's like complaining about this very specific issue. <laughs> and and like if I met them in real life at Libre Plan or whatever, like we talked face to face, I'd probably have a better time uh, explaining what my issues were. And, and I'd be able to be like, I'm Martin. I, I'm involved in the Skipper project. I need this problem. I need to figure out a solution to this problem before Inkscape, right? It's not for something. But then again, like if I could turn up, if I could rock up to the non project and lay down a fat, a fat wad of bills and be like, I need this problem fixed. Uh, could you fix this for me? It's a different type of relationship. I might not need the the uh, the organization of the of the trust, right? The trust network to follow me around. I sorry, I just love that image. The wad of cash. <laughs> no one has problems. Pew, fix. Yeah. <laughs> Slap. Uh, <laughs> You know, a couple of people, well, first, more kudos, great presentation, Mr. Owens. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, a couple of people have asked, actually, um, about training. Do you actively, you know, do you have training opportunities for users of Inkscape? Uh, another person has asked for your Patreon link, which which might be somewhere. And, uh, you know, this one, again, might be a little out of scope. I'm, I'm wrapping them all together, though. Um, but you're welcome to address it if you like. And it's uh, somebody's looking for uh, recommendations. Um, for someone who's starting in illustration uh, or digital art as a field? Um, to, to start with the uh, recommendations, so it depends on what type of digital art you are doing and where you want to focus. Um, the David Rivoy did, a, did an excellent talk about being involved in the free software world as a, as a digital artist. Uh, Critter is an excellent tool to be involved with. Um, Inkscape is good at design uh, specifically, like logos and things. Um, Blender can actually be very good at animating. Believe it or not, you can import an SVG and and like animate it. And I don't know if you've ever seen Chris Rogers' uh, videos, both GNOME video. Like, look at the no. look at the GNOME project release video that Chris Rogers made. It's it's beautiful animation, graphics made in Inkscape and then imported into Blender oh, cool. and animated. Um, so you you know it, each of the tools that you learn in the free software world is it, it can is, is a power, and then you can power up by combining them. Um, personally, I'm not actually very experienced in critter or blender um so for me my power is limited to programming uh, which is why i ask for help so much um there was a couple of other questions that i was interested in answering there could you rewind yeah rewinding um actually uh somebody wanted your patreon link yeah oh it's it's dr mo d-o-c-t-o-r-m-o -O. so patreon.com forward slash dr mo okay and uh someone uh, a few people were asking about inkscape training if you're holding any i guess so <laughs> yeah, if, if, pe if people are interested, um, maybe I'll join the IRC channel and get people's details because I actually offer, so when pe people come into the Rocket Chats, which is chat.inkscape.org, people come into that chat room and they ask a question about how to fix a problem. Sometimes it's not possible to do, uh, to give an answer in, in chat. And so we have a big blue button instance, which is kindly uh, donated for French U University, which we jump onto often to give people instruction, all right, uh, to be like, oh, how do you do this? And, and then we walk them through, much like we are here on blue, Big big Blue Bottom, but I'd be with one, maybe two other individuals where I'm, I'm walking a user through. And uh, I'll be honest, they're, they're kind of surprised that, you know, a programmer or even another designer would be um, attentive enough to give somebody instruction. Um, I think as a programmer, uh, it is interesting how, um, I, I should not. I should not technically be the per person to come to for tra training, if that makes mm. sense. Because as as a profession, I want to be programming, um, but yeah. I completely understand the need to fill the hole, which is making sure that people can using Skip effectively. And also, there's a lot to learn as a pro programmer of being involved in support, right? Helping the users on on the front lines. Oh, that's great, and, and totally makes sense. Um, I. Somebody actually did us the, the favor of posting your Patreon in oh, the IRC, you. so that's good. Uh, somebody also posted a link uh, to cr uh, other crowdfunding uh, platforms, kind of a bit of a list, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Um, you know, this one's interesting, um, and it's about um, 
payment infrastructure at the distro level. And I think some distros, or at least one that I've heard of, does this. But you know, in GNU Linux um, or you know operating system of choice. Well, I guess no. Let's focus on the free stuff. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you know, what are your opinions on that? This user says um, if their distro actually had a payment option built in, they would they would use it. You know, I've 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 um, spent so much time. Uh, talking to people in Debian and Ubuntu. I, I used to be involved in the Ubuntu project. I was at physically at UD, the Ubuntu developers summits where I'd bring this prob problem up, right? They had an app store, they were taking money and yet like it was impossible to have Inkscape for money. It was just, it was, it was like a mad situation where resources could be given to proprietary software in the Ubuntu world, but not to free software. Um, simply because the problem is too hard and, you know, who do you give the money to and, you know, who do you try? And the, the answer at the end of the day is literally give it to anybody. Like just f find a programmer that works on the thing and give them the money. Like it, it's not, it's not, a hard, it's not necessarily a hard problem. I get it. There's trust issues, there's legal issues and so forth and so on. But like at the end of the day, stop, stop being a barrier, right? To, to flowing of contributions. Um, I know that there's people who are working on the problem. There's package kit, which could have some extensions done to it to, to you know, provide ways of donating. Uh, I also know that uh, there's a lot of free software pro projects that release onto the uh, Android App Store, for example, or on the Microsoft App Store, and they have a free and a, and a uh, contribution versions, right? They have two different versions. Uh, and then there are actually some other free software projects who are free in the F-Droid and not free in, in, in Android, oh. in the Android App Store. Uh, OSM AND is a good example of this. Um, and so, like, if, the, if, the, um, if there is a way of making it easier for users to cooperate, then it's good. Having said all of that, any infrastructure that's given inside of a inside of an operating system desktop, for example, uh, I think must also be involved with making sure the user has and continues to have a voice right within the project that they're funding. It's no good just paying for something. You, you know, as I said in the talk, it's not about rewarding you for work you did in the past. Right. We want to enable users to push projects forwards to get better and more specifically get better in the ways that users need. Right. And that really does involve having opening this dialogue up, right? Yeah, no, and it, it's a slightly, well, it's a very, it's a very specific nuance. A, a few people are bringing up the pay what you want model, and this is getting at something, something different. Um, we do have two minutes left. Um, so I will give you um, a chance to kind of say any, you know, final, if, you, if there are any final messages. Um, and the only other thing I'll pick up on, and, and again, you're welcome to leave it or not. I don't quite understand the context, but I, um, the popularity contest, uh, specifically in the Debian distribution, and people are talking about using that as a rough metric, but but I didn't get the full context. I don't know if that flags anything for you that you'd want to talk about. Or... There's, a, there's a system called Popcon, which okay. may be related to that, but maybe I could join IOC and figure out what the specifics are. Okay. Uh, I know. I know. I was badly rebuffed by the Debian pro project when I suggested money should be involved, and they, and they were like, predominantly, nope, not interested. <laughs> Maybe it was, it was the wrong, the wrong year to talk to them about the problem. But it, this is why I think this is a cultural thing that has to come with some structures, right? Some, some example of the fact that I've not just come here and say money would be a good idea, but I've thought about this problem over many years. I've had many, many discussions, and I think. Uh, this isn't a problem we should shy away from. Um, this is something that we could uh, use to improve the freedom. And I think that uh, freedom is, is one of the most valuable parts of a free software project. And if users are not getting freedom to modify, then they're not really getting all of the val value, right? And is it is it a surprise that they treat us like free were when yeah. there's, no, there's no route to being involved? Well, uh, on that note, would you like to end, or is there anything else you'd like to add? That's, I mean, I'll answer questions all day, but like, thank, thank you so much. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Martin. I, I mean, again, this was um, a really important talk, and uh, thanks for for being so engaged and for bringing your experience and 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 expertise and, and insights to this. And and again, for everybody who's watching, um, Martin, if if you'd like to continue the conversation. Uh, 
an IRC with them, of course, you're welcome to. A lot of people saying thanks, Martin, and uh, oh, thanks, many thanks, claps, many claps. So uh, again, it was great to meet you, and thanks again. Yeah, thank you, James, uh, for moderating, and I hope to see you, and we can talk in real life someday. Yeah, that sounds great. I hope so, too. All right, everybody. Cheers. Enjoy the, the rest of the conference. <laughs> We're almost, almost done. Sad. Take care.